Good morning and welcome to St. Andrews on this, what is it, the 15th Sunday of Pentecost. Uh, several announcements. Um, Wednesdays, the Bell Choir will be meeting at 645 and then the choir at 730. So that's each Wednesday night. This coming Saturday, September 23rd, is the memorial service for Paul Bartles at 11 o'clock. The following Saturday, September the 30th, uh, the time to be announced is the memorial service for Margaret Everly. Uh, she was the secretary here for 15 plus years. And then something Pastor John and I have been talking about for, for well over a year, and we're going to go ahead with it on Saturday, October 7th. We're going to have our first men's prayer breakfast. That'll be at 8.30. Mark your calendars. All men are welcome. Bring a friend, relative and uh, look forward to having you. Are there any announcements from the congregation? Good morning. Good morning. Two weeks from tomorrow, October 1st, is the picnic in the park in Le Moyne at 1030. Same as the last few years that Youth and Family is going to be sponsoring the food for this event. Um, we're going to shake things up a little this year. We're doing sandwiches instead of having to bring the grill and do all of that. Um, so Youth and Family will be providing drinks and the makings for sandwiches is going to be make your own. I'm going to put a sign up out in the narthex. Um, we'll be looking for just cold salads to share, um, desserts. So that'll be out there after worship, not to be confused with the sign-up sheet that's out there for Paul's service. Um, I'm not sure. I think that's still out there. But just make sure that you take a note of what you're signing up for. If you have any questions, um, you can contact Liz or I. And there's lots of tomatoes in the garden, so feel free to help yourself. I haven't ventured over that way yet. So to each of you in the sanctuary here, anyone in the parking lot and those on Zoom, feel God's presence and know his everlasting love. Okay. <clears throat>
all of us who are able, please rise for the confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I, de I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our gathering hymn. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Thank you. 
Lord be with you. And also with you. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading this morning is from the 50 or the 50th chapter of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do, me, to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Yep, so. We will read responsively Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and the all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's? You made known your ways to Moses and your works to the children of Israel. You will not always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love for those who fear you. As a father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you, O Lord. <clears throat> I'd like to invite the children to come forward for uh, children's time for all ages.
Well, good morning, everyone. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness, and one of the most beautiful stories of, about forgiveness uh, in Scripture is the story of Joseph and his brothers. Um, I really hope that uh, sometime someone sits, sits down with you, uh, maybe one of your parents or someone from the church, and tells you the story of Joseph and his brothers. It's found in Genesis chapter 1. It's a very long story. Uh, I'm just going to share with you a little bit about the beginning and the ending of that story. Um, Joseph was born into a very large family. He had 12 brothers and, and some sisters, uh, no doubt. And uh, his father's name was Jacob. And Jacob, his father, did something that no father should ever, ever, ever do to a son, and that is to show favoritism. Uh, he really, really liked Joseph, who was the last born son. He was the youngest son. And he bought, uh, he bought Joseph, um, uh, a long, the scripture says, a long-sleeved robe. And if you um, have a King James Version, it says a coat of many colors. And Joseph would wear this uh, robe um, all the time. Uh, his older brothers would be out in the fields working. They would have their work clothes on. But Joseph would go out to the into the fields uh, to see uh, how his brothers were doing. And uh, what, do you think, uh, what do you think they thought of Joseph coming out to, to visit them with his long sleeve robe? Well... They didn't like it very much. They, they resented him. Um, and he would go back home and tattle on his brothers. He would tell his father what they were doing or what they weren't doing out in the fields. So uh, this, went, this went on and on. And... Um, Again, I'm, I'm leaving a lot of the story of Joseph out. It's a, it's a very long story, but his brothers, um, this, they had had enough of, of all of this. Uh, they really resented Joseph, so they decided they were going to kill him, to do away with him. And then they began thinking about it. No, we better not do that. What we'll do instead is put him in a pit. We'll put him in a pit and this big deep hole and just leave him there. And that's what they did. And um, Joseph, um, he had... <laughs> he had the good fortune of being found and um, he, to make a long story short, he became a slave in Egypt. And, uh, but God was with him, and he prospered in Egypt and became very, very powerful uh, in the king's or the pharaoh's court. In the meantime, let's skip now to the ending, um, Jacob dies, his father dies, and uh, one of the things that Jacob tells his sons who had committed this great wrong against Joseph is, you must seek forgiveness uh, from Joseph. He kind of, he's on his deathbed, and he, he, tells, his, he tells his brothers, You've got to seek forgiveness from Joseph. So jo they're all together for, for the funeral. And, uh, Joseph's brothers come to Joseph and, and say, will you forgive us? And 
what's Joseph's reaction going to be? Um, you know, think about, think about what they had done to him. What do you think his reaction was? Well, Joseph ended up forgiving his brothers. He said, even though you intended to harm me, God intended it for good. God had other purposes in mind. Um, and so I myself will provide for you and your little ones. He reassured, he reassured them. Uh, it was quite an emotional scene. Uh, Joseph's brothers were crying. Joseph was crying. The whole place, it was just one big um, um, room full of weeping going on. They embraced and they forgave each other. Well, uh, forgiveness is hard to do, as, as you just saw in that story. But God does call us to forgive each other. Even in the Lord's Prayer that we say each and every Sunday, it says uh, to forgive our trespasses uh, as we forgive the trespasses of others. So we are called to do that. So thank you for listening today. Uh, before you go back to your seats, uh, let me have a prayer with you. Dear God, bless us and our families. Keep us close to one another, even as we go our separate ways. Give us patience and love for one another. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening today. second reading this morning is from the book of Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed, has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds, those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For the, to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went out and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he, he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. For several weeks now, we have been in a section of Matthew's Gospel in which Jesus talks at length about what relationships in the Christian community are like, a section in which he makes the same point over and over again, that our life together, that is, the family of God, is the most important thing in the world. And that those who belong to it are called to do everything in their power to nourish and strengthen the bonds of their love. Nothing is to get in the way of that. Not their quarrels, not their rivalries, not their tendency to put each other down. If one of them goes astray, they are to stop what they are doing and go find the lost one. If one of them does wrong and separates himself from the community, they are to go and try to bring them back. Listening to Jesus talking like this, the disciple Peter becomes concerned about what exactly is required of him. He is searching for a guideline, a limit, as to how far he must go with this relationship business. 
And thus the story begins with a mathematical question. Lord, he asked Jesus, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Now that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Even merciful. The rabbis had always said to forgive someone three times. That's going more than the second mile. But Jesus responds differently to his friend. I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. I can imagine that Peter got out his calculator and began to multiply and then looked up at Jesus with this incredulous expression on his face, Lord, that's 490 times. This reminds me of a cartoon which uh, dealt with the gospel parable of the prodigal son. Uh, I'm sure you know all of that. The forgiving father was going down the road to welcome his wayward but repentant son back home. And the caption reads, I'll be glad when this boy grows up. This is the sixth fatted calf I've had to kill. Peter would certainly have understood that father's frustration with his son. It isn't in the text, but I can imagine, um, or I can almost hear Jesus tenderly saying, Peter, put away your calculator. It's not about the math or keeping score. Forgiveness cannot be tallied. It is unlimited. Forgiveness is an attitude, a way of life. Peter, it's a matter of the heart. In this strange calculus of heaven, forgiveness is never some isolated, occasional act, but is the constant homework of Christians. Unfinished business, always. We should be so generous of heart as to forgive beyond our ability to count. But, but of course, we don't. Here's my dilemma, and maybe yours as well. I just hate to see anybody get away with something. For example, those online hackers who breach data security, let's, let's say at a hospital, and then access and take all kinds of sensitive personal information, are they ever caught and charged for their crime? I hope so, but I don't hear anything about it usually. How about the phone scammers who pose as trusted officials but rob some people, particularly the elderly, out of their life's savings? Shouldn't they be punished? And why is shoplifting so rampant, particularly in some of our larger cities? They just seem to get away with it. We human beings seem to have limits when it comes to forgiveness. A wrong suffered, particularly against our honor, our self-respect, is most difficult to forgive. I still miss uh, Charles Schultz and his wonderful Peanuts cartoons. Uh, in one cartoon, Lucy goes from person to person. She has a piece of paper in her hand, and she says... Sign this, it absolves me from all blame. She asks the dog who thinks she's crazy. She asks Peppermint Patty, she asks Linus, and not knowing any better, he signs the paper. She continues to make her rounds, saying over and over, sign this. It absolves me from all blame. 
She finally gets around to Charlie Brown, and he says, I don't understand. Lucy says, just sign it. And Charlie Brown adds his signature. And she says, again, no matter what happens, any time or any place in the world, this absolves me from all blame. To which Charlie Brown says, that must be a nice document to have. <laughs> Though we are commended and commanded to forgive as we have been forgiven, forgiveness seems contrary to our nature. Forgiveness is often far from our minds, whether for great offenses or small. Our judgments tend to be rather stringent, a matter of retribution, of meeting wrong with punishment. Major offenses like 9-11, uh, which we observed last week, I think the 22nd anniversary, uh, they don't come around that often, thank goodness. But small offenses come at us nearly every day. I want you to think of, of the worst of these small offenses that anyone has ever done to you. For example, maybe the lie that was spread about you, or the time you were falsely punished, or the deal in which you were cheated, or the person who really insulted and wronged you, maybe even at a church meeting. Focus on that act and the person behind it. Now, picture yourself extending your hand, forgiving that person who has so terribly wronged you. Would you agree with me that there is just about nothing as tough as forgiving someone of the wrong they've done to you? For a while, we might be like Peter, gracious enough to forgive our neighbors, friends, or family members a good number of times. But sooner or later, the ledger mounts up, and the bearer of forgiveness all of a sudden becomes the carrier of a grudge. The second part of Jesus' word on forgiveness this morning comes in the form of a parable. It's, it's a very uh, uh, interesting parable where we see this balancing of the ledger illustrated. It's, it's about a king who wishes to settle accounts, that is, balance the books, in other words, to set things right, to do justice. A servant owed him uh, 10,000 talents. One talent is the equivalent of 15 years labor. The servant owed his master something like $150 million in today's money. When the servant couldn't pay, the king ordered him, his wife, and children to be sold, which seems very harsh. But 150 million is a lot of money. Imagine a king giving a servant even 1 million. That would be a generous king. But this king has lavished 150 million in loans on just this one servant. How could this servant possibly have wasted so many millions? You can't blame the king for being angry. It's time for decisive action. Put him in jail and let them think it over. But then the servant falls down and literally worships the king. Have patience with me, and I still and, and I will repay you everything, he says. In a burst of outlandish pity. The master sets him free and cancels the whole debt, all 150 million of it. Here the story begins to sound improbable. What, what kind of a king is this? Certainly a soft-hearted king, to be sure. Now, don't get too excited. The king's generosity is short-lived. 
Once he found his way out of jail, this servant who has been forgiven a $150 million debt runs into a fellow servant who owes him a measly $1,000. He grabs him by the neck and nearly chokes him, saying, pay back what you owe me. Have patience with me and I will repay you, he, he pleads. But no, he puts him in the slammer to let him think it over. Well, his fellow servants go and tell all of this to the king who had originally uh, forgiven uh, Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. Generosity. And now the king comes back down to earth. You evil servant, I forgave you that gigantic debt and you, and you jailed your fellow servant for a, for a mere $1,000. I'm sick that I was ever so merciful to you when I see how little mercy you show to someone else. And then, and then the angry master sentences his servant to life in prison. Here I think the story gets uh, fairly real to most of us. Uh, we would not understand someone who would write off such a huge, massive debt. But by the end of the story, when this uh, uh, once forgiven servant now socks it to his fellow servants, we are delighted to see him let off to prison. Great, we say to ourselves, he's getting what he deserves. We who were not particularly in the vengeance at the beginning of the story applaud as this ungrateful servant is led away to jail. He's getting what he deserves, we say. He, he ought to go to prison for that. You see, this is the way the world goes round. We, we love a story and what goes round comes back around. You sow what you reap. You get what you deserve and all that. We live for those moments when accounts are settled. I suppose that is what uh, those terrorists of 9-11 thought they were doing. They were acting to settle accounts for whatever past wrong they were attempting through their violence to set right. So what we see around us many times, most of the time, is a lot of tit for tat, a lot of punishment, a lot of judgment. And it's a fairly accurate picture of our world, we must admit. And yet this story is told by the one who refused, when wronged, to use brutality or violence. When wrong was done to him, he did not say, I'll get you back for this. You know what he said. As he hung from the cross, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. And that is when the eternal cycle of vengeance and retribution was derailed. That's when our kingdoms crumbled and accounts were settled so as to put our books eternally in the red. So as best as I can say it, that is what real forgiveness is all about. Pure, unadulterated grace. It's a matter, it's a matter of understanding that you have already been forgiven. That someone to whom you owe everything from your life and breath to all of the loves of your life, someone who has given and given and given to you and who has got precious little in return, that someone has taken the stack of your IOUs and torn them in two, balancing your books in one fell swoop for one reason only, because that someone wants to remain in a relationship with you and wants 
you to be free to respond. Once when you consider how many times you have been forgiven yourself, through no merit of your own, you sort of feel um, foolish keeping score on the people in your own life. If I am able to forgive at all, it is because I have been forgiven. Because thanks to someone else, I know how it feels to have my debts canceled and my relationships renewed. Once you have let that thought sink in, once you have really taken that into your own heart, how can any of us pass up the opportunity to do likewise to those around us? Amen. Let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We pray for the church, 
bless the missions and ministries of diverse congregations, that they uplift the good news of salvation in ways that can be understood. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for creation. Send rain to lands experienced drought and healing of rivers clogged, clogged with pollution. Enrich the soil for trees and plants. Protect the crops needed to feed those who hunger. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for all who govern. Encourage those in positions of power to lead with empathy. Practice forgiveness and care for those who struggle. In particular, we pray for the people of Ukraine. We ask for your power at work for those whose lives are being torn apart, both under assault and for those being forced into violence beyond their nature. Merciful God, our prayer. we pray for our neighbors who face illness of any kind, for those strained financially, for all living with chronic pain, mental illness, the disease of addiction, or otherwise afraid or in harm's way. We lift before you particular situations for people allowed silently or by chat. Protect all who cry out for mercy. Merciful God, we pray for this congregation. Open our hearts to practice intentional invitation. Help us to forgive each other, practice patience, and choose welcome over judgment. Move us to care for those in our community seeking refuge and safety. Merciful God, we give thanks for the saints who died in faith. Show us how to live faithfully, creatively, and lovingly in your church. Merciful God, remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these in the prayers of our heart. Trusting in your compassion, made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You. Please share greetings with those around you. Before we take communion, we have to go in the back. Uh, Nadja is there. Hi, everybody. Peace, peace. everybody. Peace, Sam. Peace, you, Bonnie. Matt, Madra, peace. Good to see everybody. Good morning. Peace to be with you. Peace. Bye. Peace. Thank you, Matt, Madra. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Okay. Let us continue our worship with the offering.
Let us pray. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord who rose beyond the bounds of death and on his way, as he had promised, poured out your spirit of life and power upon the chosen disciples. At this, the whole earth exults in boundless joy. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, in mercy for our fallen world. You gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live.
<clears throat> to those who might be in the parking lot or at home, take and eat and drink, for this is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken and shed for you. Amen. Blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take a drink, the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us rise, all who are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Jesus Christ, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out, and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Go in peace. God is at work in you. Thanks be to God.